name is Herbert Miller. And the uh, first time I saw Father Capon was when I was laying in a ditch, wounded. Well, Herbert Miller was a, a man that was in Father Capon's unit. Um, and he and uh, other men were, were trying to escape or trying to make it back to, to safety. This soldier come down through and he stood over, he's going to shoot me. Had the gun pointed at my head. And he said he just closed his eyes and he said he knew that the next thing that he was going to feel was a bullet going into his head. I looked and this American come across the road. And he said he saw an American soldier pushing this North Korean out of the way. It was Father Capon. He pushed the man aside. Why that soldier never shot him, I'll never know. Army Chaplain Amel Capon will posthumously receive the Medal of Honor for his acts of valor during the Korean War. I think if he were asked whether or not he wanted this award, he would probably say, heck no, that, that he, he didn't deserve the award. He'd be humbled. He, he, He'd tell you point blank, I don't deserve it, but he, that's the kind of person he was. But the men that were in the prison camp have been working for this Father Capon to receive this award, literally from the time they got out of the prison camp. I wonder why it took so long. The man should have got it right off the bat for the things he did. From the stories shared by his fellow soldiers, to the memorials at the church where his sermons began. Chaplain Capon's selfless service is eternal. He was there in the prison camp for about six or seven months before he passed away. Two and a half years later, when the rest of the men were, were freed from the prison camp, they were still speaking of Father Capon and how he had touched their lives. How could you forget somebody that saved your life? I was looking right up the barrel of that gun. He was known as a soldier's chaplain. He wasn't above us. He was one of us. But uh, we found out later that he died, and we knew they killed him. Friend, chaplain, father. Emile J. Capon goes by different names to many people. But to all who knew him or honor him today, Emile Capon is a hero. He had his apostles gathered about him one day, and he said to them, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled or be afraid. Emile Capon was born on a Kansas farm in 1916. Even as a child, Emile felt a higher calling. By 1940, he was ordained a priest in the Roman Catholic Church, and in 1944, during World War II, he chose to serve as a chaplain in the U.S. Army. And somewhere along the way, after the end of World War II and the Korean War was spinning up, he felt a calling to go back to the people that he really cared for, that he already suffered with, that he went to war with. Father Capon had always felt the, that call that he was there to, to serve the, 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 the men in the, the military or the soldiers. So he asked to go back again and eventually was given permission to go back to serve once again, which is how he wound up in Korea. The world regards peace as freedom from suffering, freedom from want, freedom from fighting. But the peace which God gives is a gift which exists even in suffering, in want, or even in time of war. November 1st, 1950, Chaplain Capon is with the 8th Cavalry Regiment in Korea in pursuit of retreating North Korean forces. Near the city of Unsan, thousands of Chinese soldiers take the 8th Cav by surprise. By early morning on November 2nd, the 3rd Battalion was surrounded. They didn't have any idea that the Chinese were even there. We ran into a buzzsaw right before this battle started. Father Capon told us, he says, men, he says, some of us aren't going to get out of here alive. I said, yeah, I'll never forget that. He said, so just prepare yourself. During the fight, Capon moves under fire to rescue wounded from the no man's land outside the perimeter, negotiates with the enemy for the safety of wounded soldiers, and rejects multiple opportunities for escape. At that time, they were given orders to try to disperse. If, if they were able to make it out to, to safety, the men were told that they just needed to flee to try to make it, make it back to safety. I went up to Father Capon. I says, uh, 
are you going to go with us when, we, when they give us the orders to try to get out of here? He says, no, sir. He says, my place is here with the sick and wounded. He stayed behind. Their intention was that they would be marched to the prison camps that were along the, the border between North Korea and China. Um, so it was well known that, that if, if you were not able to walk or not able to march, that they would just immediately kill you. First time I saw Father Capon was when I was laying in a ditch, wounded. And he said he was hiding underneath this soldier, but he said he felt him being pulled off the top of him. And he said, sure enough, there was a North Korean soldier there with a rifle. And I was looking right up the barrel of that gun, and I figured this is it. This is all there is to it. He said he tried to get up. He said he just fell back down because he could not stand on his leg, on his broken leg. And about that time, this little dirt road, I looked, and this American come across the road, and it was Father Capon. He pushed the man aside. Why that soldier never shot him, I'll never know. And he picked me up and carried me. We were both captured at that time. So he carried him for those 30 miles. Capon and Miller are led with other prisoners, many wounded, to prison camp number five at Pyeongtong. On the long march, the GIs only have dry corn and millet for food, and they drink contaminated water. Capon works tirelessly to boost morale. He would go up and down the line telling us guys that were carrying litters, you know, to you know, keep keep going and don't give up and all this stuff, you know, because those things were getting heavy, because we were pretty, you know, we hadn't anything to eat. Inside the prison camps, Chaplain Capon tends to the sick, gives away his own food and medicine, and leads prayer for the POWs. The winter of 1950 is brutally cold. The conditions take a heavy toll on the soldiers. Father Capon took a liking to the enlisted men. He would uh, break out of the officer's compound and into the enlisted men's compound, and he would go from hut to hut. He stepped inside where the Chinese couldn't see him, and he passed that little pipe around to each of us to get a smoke. Then he looked out the door to see where the Chinese guards were, and then he slipped out and went down to another house. He just give them the will to live. That's the main thing. You got to keep the will to live when you're a prisoner like that. People don't understand the way prison camp works. If he'd have got caught, he'd have been shot. There's no question in my mind. He'd come over and talk to you, you know, tell you now, don't pay any attention to this good propaganda they're giving us. Then he would pray, and uh, everybody always looked forward to that. He was able to transform those huts into a cathedral. He said it was a mud hut, but he said when Father Capon was there, he said you had just a sense of peace, the sense of calm, and the sense of hope. We can surely expect that in our own lives there will come a time when we must make a choice between being loyal to the true faith or of giving allegiance to something else which is either opposed to or not in alliance with our faith. They can break you down and get you to believe there's no God or something like that. Father Capon would talk right up to him. I mean, he'd come right out and almost tell them, call them liars. He'd come right back at them with scripture. He never gave in an inch to those people. He defied them right to the end. In May, Chaplain Capon begins to suffer from the conditions of his captivity. We'd heard that he had been sick, that some of the officers would, would get on him about that that he wasn't, he was giving too much of his food to the sick. He wasn't getting enough nourishment for himself. Across this little valley, I looked over where the officer's compound was, and I saw Father Capon, and at that time he had a bruise on the side of his face. I saw that, and that was the last time I saw him. When the Camp Five, uh, they had this so-called hospital. They called it the hospital, it was just a building, there wasn't any more hospital, nothing. They, they wanted him dead, but they didn't want to shoot him. Because he was a bad, he was a, a, an influence on everybody in that camp, it, even if we didn't see him. We were thinking of him, see. So they took him to that hospital, you know, they wouldn't give him treatment. We found out later that he died, and we knew they killed him. He was an example, if nothing, a leader among all of them, that if he folded, 
then they had nothing to believe in because he was a representation of God there among them, of hope. He was a great soldier in that he was willing to give his life for those people that he was serving with, and he obviously did just that. The Lord give him strength to save my life. Why he come across that road just to save me? It had to be a miracle. The stuff that he did for us, to help us, it's, it's unbelievable. And I'll always remember that to the day I die. But Father Capon is the one that uh, I owe him everything. Blessed are they who suffer persecution for justice sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. May the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon all of you. Amen. There are many stories about heroes throughout our nation's history. Stories of extraordinary heroism, patriotism, and selfless service. Men and women who fought to protect our country and our way of life. This is the story of Chaplain Emile J. Capon. Chaplain Capon is assigned to Headquarters Company, 8th Cavalry Regiment, 1st Cavalry Division. Chinese Communist forces have encircled the battalion, outnumbering them. Chaplain Capon moved fearlessly from foxhole to foxhole under direct enemy fire in order to provide comfort and reassurance to outnumbered soldiers. He repeatedly exposed himself to enemy fire to recover wounded men and drag them to safety. When he couldn't drag them, he dug shallow trenches to shield them from enemy fire. As Chinese forces closed in, Capon rejected several chances to escape, instead volunteering to stay behind and care for the wounded. He was taken as a prisoner of war by Chinese forces on November 2nd, 1950. Chaplain Capon believed in the warrior ethos. Um, never leave a soldier behind, and he believed that wherever the soldier um, goes, the chaplain shall also go and support. Upon being captured, Chaplain Capon and other prisoners marched for several days towards prisoner of war camps. During the march, Capon led by example, caring for injured soldiers, refusing to take a break from carrying the stretchers of the wounded, all while encouraging others to do their part. Once inside prison camps, Chaplain Capon risked his life by sneaking around the camp after dark, foraging for food, caring for the sick, and encouraging his fellow soldiers to sustain their faith and their humanity. When the Chinese instituted a mandatory re-education program, Capon patiently and politely rejected every theory put forth by the instructors. Capon openly defied his captors by conducting a sunrise service on Easter morning, 1951. After suffering from the physical toll of his captivity, he was transferred to a substandard hospital where he died alone. Chaplain Capon died in captivity on May 23, 1951. Chaplain Emile J. Capon repeatedly risked his own life to save the lives of hundreds of fellow Americans. His extraordinary courage, faith, and leadership inspired thousands of prisoners to survive hellish conditions, resist enemy indoctrination, and retain their faith in God and country. His actions reflect the utmost credit upon him the 1st Cavalry Division, and the United States Army. He was initially awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, but because of his actions on November 1st and 2nd, 1950, his award is being upgraded to the Medal of Honor. We in the 1st Cavalry Division are very honored to follow in the footsteps of Chaplain Capuan. Chaplain Capuan represented everything good that is the American soldier, the sacrifice, the dedication, and most importantly in this case, the humanity that we demonstrate every day in what we do. Thank you, Chaplain Capuan. Reporting for the 1st Cavalry Division, I'm Army Sergeant Elliot Valdez. The half-forgotten Korean campaign, and men who should never be forgotten. Especially such men as Chaplain Emil Joseph Capuan. Certainly, he never will be forgotten by the men who served with him. Would you like me to write to him? Very nice of you. 
Looks like you're gonna have to write a lot of letters. I'm scared. A little bit too late for me to be scared, isn't it? How old? How old are you, Bart? Twenty. Almost. I don't think you've got much to be worried about. I'd like to think so. I guess I haven't lived long enough to be a very big sinner. You've been a big man. Thank you, Father. A father who I can have in thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and the night of our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Amen. Thank you, Father. I'll take over, Father. This is my department. It's my department, too. I'm not leaving him. You don't have to leave him. He's left you. The sick, the wounded, and the weak, unable to endure the death march into captivity, fell by the roadside. The horror of the death march ended in a prison stockade deep within enemy territory, where a new agony of survival began. In this prison hut, there were no lines of creed or color. There were only Americans, Antonelli, Samuels, Murphy, Martinez. The sick and wounded are refused medical care. Each is made to feel that he is alone, with nothing to look forward to but the cold, the hunger, the sickness, and death. Then, day after day, they are hammered with half-lies, half-truths, impacting against the half-starved, shivering students until comprehension of what is falsehood and what is truth is almost lost. To refuse to attend the lectures means no food at all and quick man-killing punishment. Ask yourselves the question, what are you doing here in Korea? Did you want to come? Are the Korean people your enemies? Are the Chinese? Does your country have possessions in Korea that it must protect? You have been betrayed! All of you! You are puppets in the hands of imperialistic warmongers who seek to keep China from finding a place in the sun. Were you fighting to keep the imperial colonies of Hong Kong and Shanghai in British hands? They are Chinese, you know, carved out of the heart of China with British bayonets. Were you fighting to keep the French imperialists in Indochina, the Dutch in Indonesia? Pardon me, comrade. May I ask a question? Yes, if it is constructive. Oh, it is. Then I'll be happy to answer it. Who is fighting the imperialistic Russians to keep them out of China? Russia is a friend of China. Pardon me. Perhaps I was confused. The Russians are a people's democracy like China. Well, tell me, is it not fact that Russia carved Outer Mongolia, Manchuria, Tibet, and other territories out of the heart of China, just as they carved Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Latvia, Estonia, out of the heart of Europe? Capitalistic Wall Street lies. Oh, I'm just seeking the truth. Then. The Russians hold Manchuria. That is different. The Russians are in China as invited guests. Oh. Well, then the, then the Chinese government ruled these Chinese provinces occupied by the Russian troops. Really, the Russians are taking their orders from the Chinese. Yes. Uh, uh, that is no. Tell us, comrade, how many Russians have you given orders to? Sit down. I'll have all of you punished. What for, comrade? I'm just trying to help these men to understand the truth of your facts. You're an obstructionist, you and your church. Everything you say, everything you do, ever since you've been here. Father Capone was subjected to special punishments for daring to administer to the spiritual needs of his fellow prisoners. He had defied the Red Orders against holding religious services. This should cure you of your stupid Bible talk and listen to our sensible talk. Stop telling your comrades otherwise. How is he? 
I don't know how he's hung on this long. If it was in his right mind, he'd stop hanging on. We all would. Take it easy. Face it. This is the way we're all going to end up sooner or later. You let Father hear you talk like that, he'll boot you all around the compound. I uh, had a chance to talk to him for a minute this morning. Guards weren't looking, and... He can talk? He's worried. But Martinez said we should take good care of him. Ten days at the post, standing in two tubs of ice water. He's worried about somebody else. I might know the commies are trying to kill him off. He's a bad influence on us. Why don't they take him out and give it to him in the back of the head? They've done it to plenty of others. I've been trying to figure that out. Why they don't. I think they're afraid of Father. Afraid? Afraid of a guy that can hardly walk? Maybe I'm not getting through to you. They're afraid of Father. Like a guy who's afraid to walk through a graveyard at night. You know, as if they were superstitious about him. They're afraid of what Father has inside. Well, if he comes off that post alive or dead, we're a sense to lose him anyway. You mean they're going to transfer him to the officers' quarters if they ever get it finished? That's just what I mean. How's Martinez? He can wait. Let's do something about you. Let's hope you have learned your lesson. And from now on, we are expecting cooperation from you and these men. You should be an example for your fellow prisoners. I always try to be. We shall see. Look at his feet. <laughs> What's so funny about frozen feet? You know, the first thing I'm going to do when that first American tank comes rolling down the road to this compound, I'm going to run down that comrade's son and kick him over the barbed wire fence. That is, if these dogs ever thought of it. Wish you'd live so long. Father, an American tank rolling down that road? What's that? I'm sorry. But let's not kid ourselves. That's right. Let's not kid ourselves that we're not going to make it out of here. We're awful glad you're back. Get him off, will you? Was it Martinez? Great. Honest father, great. Maybe we should send him to the hospital. You won't let him, will you, father? Take it easy, kid. Don't let him take me. Stone, he went to the hospital. He's dead. They're all dead. You just knock it off. Nobody's going to take anybody to the hospital. You ought to be ashamed for even mentioning it. This outfit takes care of its own. I'm sorry to be such a baby. we wouldn't serve this stuff to the pigs. I've never seen a pig that I wouldn't trade places with right now. You can only get enough of this stuff to know what it feels like to have a full belly. Stop dreaming. On this stuff, not even a chicken can get a full belly. That's right, Samuels. Tell me. Anybody remember what day this is? I don't even know what month it is. It's Thanksgiving. Oh, great. We've sure got a lot to be thankful for this year. You know, I remember back in Kansas. Did I ever tell you I come from Kansas? When I was a kid back on the farm, Thanksgiving was a big day. It took Mother about a week, ten days to get ready for it. I can still see Mother in the kitchen turning off pumpkin pies with a crust that melted in your mouth. Cakes, chocolate and vanilla icing. Then about four o'clock in the afternoon, we'd all sit down. Father would say grace, and we'd pitch in. Turkey with cranberry sauce, mashed potatoes with giblet gravy, plum pudding and hard sauce. Knock it off. What are you trying to do? Yeah. What are you trying to do? Drive us nuts? Making us remember things like that. Keep remembering them. Those good things about home and family. Things like Thanksgiving. 
Because then when Comrade's son starts hammering at you guys about how good the red idea is and how stinking America is, you can look him right in the eye and laugh at him for the liar he is. I'm sorry. I should have known. I get it, Merrill. Well, it may not be turkey with all the fixings, but it's still Thanksgiving. Heavenly Father, bless this food, such as it is, and this day. We have much to be thankful for. We're men living together who have learned to trust each other and to suffer together and have learned to share the good and the bad together. There's none among us who would take advantage of his friends or seek to benefit by their misfortune. For this, we give thee thanks. Amen. Amen. Where are you going, that Nelly? Don't you like turkey? I'll be right back. Well, there it is, Father. What's this? It's a whole extra bag of rations I've been scrounging from the commies for the past month. Well, I had it hid under the hut, just in case things came up tougher than they were. After listening to you, I guess this stuff would have choked me if I tried to eat it. It's very nice of you, Angelo. Thank you. It's very nice of you. Nice of me. You prayed me out of it. Well, there you are. The power of prayer. Hey, wait a minute. You didn't know I had that head out there, did you? Now, how would I know a thing like that? Well, I don't know. It just seemed like you were looking right at me, even if you were talking to the man upstairs. Just imagination. Maybe a touch of guilty conscience. Double rations. Courtesy of Mr. Angelo Antonelli. You'll be on your feet in no time now. Thanks, pal. Ah, uh, forget it. By the middle of March, 1951, the prisoners were in a desperate condition. Father Capon set them to gathering and boiling weeds in an attempt to produce vitamins. Okay. Pain I can stand. I'm beginning to swell up like a poison pup. My legs are getting those black spots on them like stone and barns. Let me out of here! Let me out of here, you nothing! Let me go! Let me out of here, I'm killing! Let me go! Just a little fight to keep warm. Do you mind? Might be one less mop to feed. Let's face it, Father, we get more to eat or we'll... We get more to eat. How? By swallowing that red hogwash comrade's son's been trying to sell us for the last six months? Yeah, like some of the guys in this camp did. Sell out to the commies for a pen full of lousy rice. Let's not judge too harshly those that are weaker than yourselves. They have but one choice. Life or death. That's all we've got. Be not afraid of them who kill the body. Sure. That sounds great. But this is the only body I got. You said we were going to get more food. But you didn't say how. Have you no faith in me? Maybe you got an angle, Father. Could be. Did you ever hear of St. Demas? No. Your education's been sad and neglected, Angelo. St. Demas was the good thief. I think I'll have a session with him. Ask him to intercede for us. I think he'll come up with the answers. Wait a minute. Who are you trying to kid? If anybody's going to steal anything, it's going to be us. Well, you never even heard of St. Demas. Father, a priest can't die. All the better. Gives me the edge. I've got the right connection. So Father Capon took upon himself the role of the good thief.
every American prisoner in that compound knew about the raids of Pothic upon on the supply ship. But he was never betrayed for any price. He was the good thief who was keeping them alive. But Father Capon did more than feed the bodies of his men. He fed their souls. He fed their hope. He fed their will to resist. And you're the guy that thought he wasn't going to make it. I didn't make it. You made it for me. He hadn't had a temperature in over a week now. That wound's healed nicely. I'd feel swell if, if only my feet didn't feel like lumps of ice. Oh. Well, we'll see what we can do about that. I'll be back. confiscate your watch. Bad policy. Especially for a man whose job it is to convince the prisoners of the attractiveness and the benefits of a communist way of life. You can have your blanket. That's a very good watch. Wind it every night. Take care of it. It was a gift to me from my mother on the day I was ordained. Very touching. And to think that you would part with such a precious memento for a blanket. Father Capone's trade with Comrade Son resulted in warm socks for the sick, fashioned by his own hands out of the material supplied by the blanket. Here now, let's try these out for size. How's that? On Easter Sunday, 1951, Father Capone again flouted the red dictate against any religious services. There were no stained glass windows, no organ music, and no vested choir. There was nothing to mark Father Capone's office as a priest, excepting the frayed bit of purple ribbon about his neck, his stole. His mass equipment was lost at the time of his capture. I, I never was much of an orator or a preacher of sermons. But Easter is a time of rejoicing. It commemorates the resurrection of the Son of God. The resurrection of the body, the spirit, and the soul. Let us never lose our faith that we too will triumph over even death. Close your ears to the blandishments of the enemy. Resist the temptation to take the easy way. But what profit of a man if he gain the whole world and loses his immortal soul? Whatever, whatever your faith may be, be strong in it. Rejoice in it. For it is the power that will conquer all the enemy. Your faith. Your faith. Talk. Preach. Talk. Preach. Talk. Preach. Talk. Preach. Talk. Go on. Talk. Preach. so much of himself to his fellow men, so much of his strength can hope to endure forever. Don't 
take it so big, will you? Just going home a little earlier than you guys, that's all. I don't need any ceasefire to set me free. Besides, you guys are big enough and tough enough to take it from here yourselves. You don't need me to lead you around with a hand no more. you're going to do? Take him to the hospital where he belongs. Over my dead body. Well, that way, if you prefer. I won't help matters any. Here are the six shackets. A matter of hours, days at the most. Besides, let's not spoil our last time together. Getting your skulls bashed in. They got your numbers. Don't let them use me as an excuse for taking it out on you. Angelo. You know the prayers. Keep holding the services. They're out. Ralph. Ralph, when you when you get back to New Jersey, you get that business about your marriage squared away. You know, you guys, first and only congregation I ever had. I wouldn't trade you for the biggest church with the biggest dome in the whole world. Okay, let's go. Each night thereafter, at lights out, Father Capone's monument was hung on the wall of the prison hut to remain until dawn. It was not a thing of stone or bronze. It was fashioned by hand from scrap wood. But he needed no monument. 